Hi, Sarah, guys. Thanks for having me. So can you tell us about your background and when and how did you get involved in the crypto space? Sure. So uh, I've been, I'm an OG. Um, I've uh, started dabbling with crypto in 2013. Um, and basically, 2014, I realized that I'm very deeply into the tech. I went to uh, grad school at MIT, and I focused on how to solve the privacy problem with blockchains. Um, that led to uh, starting a company after grad school, uh, which turned into Secret, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah, now one of the biggest Cosmos chains. So which year did you start the company? The company started in uh, 2016. I'm a, so actually, like, I started looking into it like 2011, 20, 2012, oh, and wow. I, I didn't go into the tech, so I didn't buy. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, I was a poor student, let's uh, put it that way. But um, I, I, I didn't buy because, like, to me, finances are not that interesting. I am interested in technology, and when I read, like, the white paper, the Bitcoin white paper, and then, like, the original Ethereum white paper, before it was actually the yellow paper and the actual tech, it was very high level. And a few other things, I was like, okay, this is game changing. This could change the world, not just of finance, but like more broadly. And that's when I got sucked in. I put whatever I could into the Ethereum ICO. That really wasn't a lot. Um, I'm not a great trader, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I've, I've been in, into it mostly for the tech. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so how did the idea of starting Secret come to you? Did you uh, very involved somehow into Monero or Zcash before? Not really. I mean, I knew, the, I knew both uh, some of the people in Monero and Zcash uh, fairly early on. Mm -hmm. But the motivation came, so um, there was actually a hackathon, and this is 2014, mm -hmm. about um, like, can, like, what is like, the biggest, craziest idea you can build on, on uh, blockchains, right? Mm -hmm. No one said Web3, it was blockchain. And um, I took the Ethereum Alpha uh, with the team, and we like, played with it and tried to build, and we tried to build a solution for identity. Actually, not very different than what WorldCoin is trying to do right now, mm -hmm. but like this was like almost 10 years ago. Uh, and they released it today. <laughs> yes, they released it today, so this is very timely, right? Um, and we we're like, okay, but like, how do you solve for privacy? Like, putting identity on the blockchain where everyone can see it, like that doesn't make sense. No one understood it at the time. Like today, when you say that, it's clear to everyone. But back then, no one understood it. And you know, at that point, I realized, OK, this is a problem that needs to be solved. And that's basically what I've spent my, the last decade on. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you explain more how does Secret Network work for sure. people not familiar with the project yet? Sure. So Secret Network is, I mean, think about it as a layer one blockchain mm -hmm. with smart contracts. The difference is that as a user, when I'm interacting with a contract, Right? A contract is essentially kind of like a service. Um, and when I'm interacting with a contract, I can basically encrypt my data client side. And then the secret network can actually perform operations over that encrypted data. It uses something that's called uh, secure enclaves and some cryptography. But at the end of the day, the point is that our blockchain, compared to any other blockchain, can actually operate inside of a smart contract on data that uh, you don't see. And an example I like to give is like private voting or private DAOs, right? Like when you have a DAO voting today, which a lot of people use, um, then when you vote, uh, everyone can see who you voted for. And that is susceptible to um, uh, bribes and other bad things. I mean, this is not how democracies work, obviously. So you would like your, your votes to be encrypted and still everyone to be able to verify that the result of who won is correct. So that is, for example, something that we're enabling. Right. How is your solution different from zero knowledge proofs? Well, this is something that people are starting to understand. If you're very deep in the tech, you've known that for a while, but the market is starting to understand it. Zero knowledge proofs are a good solution for scalability because of like ZK rollups. They're not so good for privacy. And even though there are ad hoc solutions um, to solve privacy, like Zcash and Tornado, 
they do a good job for the specific use case of um, private transaction, but when you try to go beyond that, um, you can't really solve it with ZK because ZK is, um, lack of a better word, actually that's a term that some ZK researcher gave me. Um, ZK solves single user privacy. You need something else for multi-users. So for example, if you wanna play poker on chain and know that the dealer, which is the chain, isn't cheating, um, you can do that with ZK because you, there is no way for me to bring my private data, which is the deck of cards that I hold and you don't see, and for you to bring the deck of cards that you hold and I should not see, there is no way to do that with ZK. You need something else. Mm -hmm. So on secret, um, we're using something called SGX, Secure Enclaves. Mm -hmm. The two other techniques are MPC, Secure Multiparty Computation, or FHE, which is Fully Homomorphic Encryption. All of those three techniques can solve the multi-user, let's say, data privacy problem. Mm -hmm. ZK actually can. And as well, you offer privacy as a service, so as a DAPS can launch a secret network. Can you tell more about this? And sure. Uh, what type of DAPS do you have on your network? So on secret today, there's quite a few DAPS, mm -hmm. um, but it's, again, it's very small compared to like the Ethereum ecosystem. And the idea is, okay, how can we get dApps that are built in Nelswell, like on Ethereum, to actually interconnect with uh, these benefits that Secret provides in a seamless way. So that's what we're coining as privacy as a service. Um, there are several, uh, quite a few applications building on that. There's BitShop, which are doing um, an NFT marketplace. Mm -hmm. But it's a different kind. It relies on a, an interesting auctioning mechanism, but the, but the bids have to be private. So they use secret for that, but the NFTs are on Ethereum. Um, there's companies building like account abstraction solutions mm -hmm. um, using secret. Um, and there's uh, quite I mean, a few others that are basically uh, using privacy service, which is again, take what secret has, but you don't have to build on secret. You can build on the outside. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, yeah, of course. It's, it's a project that relies on secret, but it, uh, I mean, I like to do research as well, and this is a, required quite a bit of heavy lifting, but again, the goal with Unstoppable Wallets is really to create account abstraction, mm -hmm. which is just giving users a more secure and simple way to access the blockchain, um, but to do that in a way that's immediately cross-chain. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing an account abstraction on Ethereum, you're locked to Ethereum. If you're doing it on Arbitrum, you're locked to Arbitrum. Mm -hmm. How do we do something that works for all EVM chains, all Cosmos chains, um, and Bitcoin, and Monero, and pretty much everything mm -hmm. in one go? And that's the idea of Unstoppable Wallets. Easier interface, easier login, if you will, mm -hmm. to the blockchain, to your assets, um, wherever you are. Uh, so is it like social recovery wallet as well, or is it it's it's, so no, social recovery is actually a feature that you get with that as well. Um, it's not the primary, like again, if you, only, if you only care about social recovery, then you can use other technologies, but this actually makes social recovery, I'd say, more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a company that's building on us called Obi, they started with social recovery using this, and they're expanding to basically a full-blown wallet. And last year, you as well launched 400 million ecosystem funds. So right. can you tell more about the projects in your ecosystem and what type of projects you're looking for to support? Sure. So again, the 400 million ecosystem fund, it was like a four-year plan with like a lot of VCs. It's all soft commits. So basically, those yeah. VCs, um, they basically are secret holders, and they are pledging their support for the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. The market crashed right after that. We've seen companies being funded uh, via that or a similar mechanism. We've seen companies that have not, unfortunately, because of the market uh, conditions. Um, but quite a few companies are building on us. Um, uh, Shade is doing very well. So Shade was a very highly anticipated DeFi, private DeFi suite. Mm -hmm. um, they, have, they launched Silk, which is the, uh, the decentralized um, stablecoin on Cosmos that has the most liquidity. They launched their own staking derivatives. 
uh, and they launched like you know a lending platform and private AMM resistant, uh, sorry, uh, MEV resistant uh, AMMs. Um, all of that is operating, getting quite a lot of uh, traction and attention. There's uh, Stash, which is an NFT marketplace uh, that's building. There's Legenda, which is trying to basically bring like premium NFT content in a gamified way, but you have data that you can't see, right? So you have to buy the NFT, the data is encrypted, only if you buy it, then you can actually see it. For example, um, we did something with Kevin Smith, who's a well-known director, and he basically released a movie on that platform as an NFT. So the only way to watch the movie was to buy the NFT. Um, yeah, quite a few of those. So what other use cases do you see for your blockchain as well? Do you think it may be uh, used by the government? Um, uh, no, I'm smiling because yeah, I think governments are slower moving, but we are actually talking and uh, quite familiar with a few of them. Not the U.S. government, to be honest. I mean, they are probably the slowest. But uh, but uh, we do see viability. So one application that we're entertaining is a privacy preserving CBDC. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather CBDCs don't exist, but I think they might, and if they exist, they need to be privacy preserving because otherwise yeah. like, we're all screwed. Um, so that's one that we're exploring and we're having some potential design partners. Mm -hmm. um, there's a medical use case that we're exploring with a fairly well-known brand. May happen, may not, but basically they wanna be able to track like, um, like medical data and records and, and drug information, mm -hmm. like across the world, but they want to obviously do it in a privacy preserving way. I mean, this is very sensitive. Yeah, and as well, the last year there was found vulnerability in a secret network. For right, a not in a secret network, in SGX, the enclave, which uh, is one of the underpinnings of secret, yeah. So how do you address this vulnerability and what changed? Oh, so, so first of all, we closed out vulnerability, we worked with some fantastic academic uh, um, advisors uh, on this to secure that. Um, we don't think any data was compromised or lost. Uh, we pretty much probably would have known by now. Um, so we closed that immediately. I mean, the, the team worked day and night to, to basically resolve that. Again, the problem was uh, something with the, there was a, a bug. Again, bug in the hardware, those happens and we had to work with Intel and the academics to close that. And then we added basically more layers of protection and we're actually adding even more. So we added stuff like key rotation. So every, you know, every time we want, or every couple of months, like the encryption keys in the network, you can rotate them so they're not the same. So even if there's an attack, it's like very, very limited. Um, and a few other hardening mechanisms to make it uh, much, much harder. Mm -hmm. And do you yourself invest a lot into crypto and public markets? So to date, I've only invested in companies that have built on Secret, and I, because I'm not a great investor or trader, so it was mostly like show of support uh, for people who are building on us. Um, I'm probably in that sense a really bad trader, but maybe a good investor because I never then bother to actually look at the tokens and, and trade them. Again, it's more of a signaling thing. Um, I... Uh, and I hold a lot of, let's say, the top assets. Um, I am a big believer in crypto. I like to keep a lot of, you know, um, let's say, my, my own capital in crypto. I believe the space will still grow 10, 100,000 X, so. Maybe you can share some names of the top tokens you hold? Oh, I'm not, I, I mean, it's very boring, like stuff like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the occasional, like, uh, maybe the infrastructure projects. Like, I, every time I try to do like DeFi or NFTs, I fail because I don't understand. I mean, I understand those markets, but like I don't have an edge in those. Mm -hmm. But when I see an infrastructure project, then um, I can very quickly say if like they, you know, they know their stuff and they have merit or no. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but generally, we see now so many layer ones, layer twos. So why are you bullish, for example, on Cosmos ecosystem? I'm bullish on Cosmos ecosystem for two reasons. A Again, I've been in this space for a long time. We're, this is playing out again, again, the same way. Every time there's a market cycle and the market is like in a bull market, mm -hmm. 
you see all the attention and money are going into dApps, which makes sense. And dApps started by being basically forks of Bitcoin, right? Like you had Namecoin, and you had like Monero, and you had like these basically app-specific um, um, chains that are forks of Bitcoin. Then you had the second cycle. This After the second cycle, uh, we had the bear market, in, in, sorry, and in the second cycle of the ICO mania, like dApps got all the money, then bear market, infrastructure again, what's next in the infrastructure? Okay, Art L1, like Cosmos, but also like Solana and all the others, we, we got all the big ones in the last bull market, and then NFTs, DeFi, like all those applications got all the money, and now we're again at this situation where, okay, like we're gonna do roll-ups, and you know, roll-ups are getting all the attention, like that's the new infrastructure, and apps like are not getting any any funding, and the I think the 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 point is it's important to understand market narratives and it's important to obviously update your belief, but at the same time like if you believe in what you're doing, then don't get caught up in like the like the current hyper framing. Like if everyone wants it to be a roll up right now, maybe roll ups are gonna win everything. But if they win everything, they're gonna become very commoditized. So just you being a roll-up is not interesting. You have, to be, you have to do something interesting that under the hood operates as a roll-up. And I think, so I'm bullish on those things, but at the same time, like, I guess my feedback to founders and VCs is like, don't get too bogged down whether something is an up chain or a roll-up or a dApp. Does it solve a user's need? Do people like what is being built? And you know, if that problem is solved, then we can even take like an app chain and figure out how to turn that into a roll up. Mm -hmm. And towards the next developments, do you see in the next one, two years what will be trendy? On secret or beyond? Oh, generally. Um, okay, so on secret, like we're gonna expand to um, Ethereum because that's where the user base is and make that simpler. As a whole, uh, FHE, fully homomorphic encryption. To me, I think that's the next UK. Thank you for having me.